All right. Something that I have not mentioned, a couple of things I have not mentioned. Oh, this is important. In the olden time, Upper Egypt, you had Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. Now, this will fool you. Upper Egypt was south. Lower Egypt was north. You might wonder, why was Upper Egypt south? Because Upper Egypt was higher in elevation than the northern Lower Egypt. And, of course, you know the Nile River flows along and forms a cataract cataract drops off. So they knew that uh, South Egypt was higher in elevation by quite a few feet than North Egypt. So they called it South Upper Egypt because of its elevation above sea level. And they called the North Lower Egypt because relative to South Egypt it was lower than South Egypt. Something else I have not I've mentioned, myth. The word myth has to do with stories of the origin of the universe or the origin of life that has to do with gods. Mythology. Um, stories that include gods as opposed to legends or usually stories that, that involve heroes. Myths, stories that involve gods. So we're going to talk more about mythologies of course when we come to the chapters on China, India, Greece and Rome, etc., etc. All right. Um, I think that's all you'll need in preparation for the test, except for what I'm about to go over in this class. All right. Now, this is our third class, fourth, fourth class, fourth class. But this morning, for the first time this semester. I got a bunch of students who kind of sneered and looked down at me, and he's going bonkers. And it, believe it or not, it wasn't what I said about mythology or theology. It was what I said about climate. Do any, have any of you heard that during the Cretaceous period, the Earth had a uniform tropical climate, including Antarctica, the polar regions? Any of you heard this? Nobody? Look, you can look it up. Cretaceous period. Uh, it's, the Earth had a uniform tropical climate, and you find tropical plants and animals, fossils, in Antarctica. They cooled down. There was a time when an ice sheet covered Europe and covered North America as far south as the Ohio River. Then the glaciers retreated, and of course, in the case of the United States, these glaciers, they retreated. They left the Great Lakes behind, but the glaciers got as far south as this. And what happened? It warmed up. Now, this is important because I believe that the history of climatology is a history of warming and cooling. Now, you've all been conditioned to be convinced that the Earth is warming and it's all man's fault. You don't, you can't yet prove it, but there are scientists who are observing and they say that they think that Mars is warming up, Neptune is warming up, Jupiter is warming. How does man-made carbon emissions warm up the planets? And I'll give you a hint, again, I don't know. Give that hint a lot. What's that? You give that hint a lot. A lot, yes. That, that is certain. Yeah. That, now, folks, what I believe strongly is that the sun controls our temperature more than anything man does. And every once, every 300 or so years, the sun cools. Cooled in the early 1300s, and what about the Black Death? When the sun cools, millions of people die of starvation because Farmers will start planting their crops on the same day they always did. They get their crops starting to come and all of a sudden the frost hits and the crops are gone. Or a frost hits just before harvest time and the crops are gone uh, because the, they froze over and the, the crops will never ripen. So, and then in the 1680s, there was a little ice age, and this is standard paleontology, standard weather. In the sixth there was an ice age. What I'm getting at, folks, is we are due. Okay, go ahead. You're far. Hey, 
none of you are old enough to remember, 1977, every sign of on the globe was predicted in Ice Age. In 1977, we had a winter like the ones we used to have, where that they had snow flurries in Miami, check the records, the Chesapeake Bay froze over, we had a tremendous amount of snow in North Georgia, Buffalo had four feet of snow, and they were afraid that the snow wouldn't melt, and the snow melted, it created a slush that, uh, I mean, that created a big amount of flooding, and all the signs around it go to ice age, ice age. Then all of a sudden that changed to global warming, global warming. All right, I know your condition, but uh, folk, again, this is one of the things I want you to consider the climate has bobbed up and down. There have been ice ages and uh, the high middle ages, if we can believe the records, they grew the type of crops that higher, farther north than we now can grow them. When the Vikings came over, they found certain types of grapes in Nova Scotia that they will not grow any farther north than New Jersey. Um, all right, I can tell most of you don't believe it, at least. But before I proceed, anybody want to anybody have a comment? Check it out, folk. Check the records. All right, I'll move on. Um, and in connection with this lesson, the one thing that brought about climate change was the Medes and Persians, whom we'll talk about in a few minutes, were forced south, possibly by a cooling of the upper, well, upper Europe. They, uh, they lived up in this region here, and four groups, the Romans, the Greeks, the Medes and Persians, and the Aryans, all started out in this region here and moved south. South because they could find warmer weather there. And it's also believed it's what destroyed the Roman Empire. The German peoples had to move because, and they moved south because their climate was too cold. But things warmed back up. All right, um, Babylon. The story of Babylon is a story of a rise and fall and a rise again. Babylon rose in the days of Amurabi. Babylon rose and then fell. They spent a thousand years looking back to their glory days. Now, for those of us who are Americans, their glory days are these days. I mean, we've not, never had it better, not really. I mean, some people have said we want to make America great again, but America is as great as it has been. But if you, if you were to have lived in Babylon, you'd look back. Oh, one time we were so great. Well, the Greeks, today the Greeks, remember the 2,000 years ago, they were so great. The um, Romans, the Italians, remember back in the days of the Roman Empire. And if you go to Macedonia, you'll find that every Macedonian is an expert on Alexander the Great. He was a Macedonian. They, some of these people, a lot of people in the world look back to a time in the case of Babylon, though, they were able to rise again under the ruler Nebuchadnezzar. All right. Um, I wrote his name here. Okay, yeah. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's father had defeated the Assyrians. He had gotten together with the Medes, and he, with the Babylonian Empire in combination with the Medes, defeated the Assyrians, and the Assyrians tried hard to rise again, but never did. And if you go meet an Assyrian, there are supposedly 10 million Assyrians today, they will tell you, they remember a time when they once was the greatest empire in the Western world, the greatest empire that they knew about. But anyway, Nebuchadnezzar defeated them. Then Nebuchadnezzar, Mary, the daughter of the, um, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar's father here. Nebuchadnezzar himself married the daughter of the king of the Medes, whom we'll talk about next. 
and um, therefore he lived at peace. Nebuchadnezzar went on to conquer, let's see, he conquered Tyre, the Phoenicians, that is. Uh, he conquered the Phoenicians. Judah, Egypt, among his other conquests, he won all of his battles, or at least almost all of them, ruled for more than 40 years. Now for those of you who know anything at all about the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned in the Bible, particularly by Jeremiah and Daniel, both of whom lived at the same time he did. Jeremiah became popular with Nebuchadnezzar because when Nebuchadnezzar was invading Judah, Jeremiah predicted that Nebuchadnezzar would win. So when the people were taken away captive, Nebuchadnezzar told Jeremiah, you can go where you want to, you're welcome to stay here, or, or go with me, whatever you want to do. Jeremiah chose to stay with there in the land of Judah. Anyway, uh, a lot of the people of Judah went to Egypt, and Nebuchadnezzar conquered Egypt also. Anyway, after, now, after Nebuchadnezzar's time passed on, he was followed by other kings, most of them named Nabu. Here's a story. You start out with the god Anu, and you go from there to Enlil, from there to Marduk, from there to Nabu. Nebuchadnezzar mean Nabu. You know, these gods, <clears throat> these gods were in temples, and one after another they fell out of favor. Now, um, again, you can only speculate why did Anu fall out of favor? Why well, it appears that he quit talking to people. Same way with en Enlil and his brother Enki. Same way with Marduk. By the time of Nebuchadnezzar, only Nabu was left. And eventually he got shelved also. Uh, I mean, after Nebuchadnezzar, there was Nebuchadnezzar, also named after Nabu. Nebuchadnezzar's father was named Nabu Palazar, or also named after Nabu. You know, they were naming themselves, the kings were naming themselves Nabu, who was the son of Marduk, who was the son of Enlil, son of Anu. But these gods all, one at a time, you might say, got X'd out. Eventually, Nebu himself was X'd out. All right. Now, oh yes. Now, <clears throat> as a child, I grew up in southern Pennsylvania, and every time you looked around outside, there were mountains. When we moved to Ohio, my brother said, I wonder what it's be like to look around us over the horizon and not see any mountains. So we moved to Ohio and there were no mountains. Well, Nebuchadnezzar's wife <clears throat> was used to mountains. Being a media, the land of media, land of Persia, land of Iran, is full of mountains. She was used to seeing mountains, so Nebuchadnezzar, to keep her happy, built what's called the Hanging Gardens. He built a big uh, ziggurat-like structure And he hang, hung certain types of plant life from the steps of his ziggurat. And these were the hanging gardens. The idea was to keep his wife happy by making uh, something that resembled a mountain right there in the city of Babylon. <clears throat> when the city of Babylon was destroyed and started to cover over, the hanging gardens, the top of this tower, was still left up there. <clears throat> Westerners did not know where the Hanging Gardens were for a long time. We didn't know where the city of Babylon was. When Western archaeologists went to Iraq and told the natives, you want to find Babylon, the bad people of Iraq knew all the time where it was, and they led them, led them right to it. And we began excavating, began digging. Saddam Hussein started to try to rebuild the city, but 
we didn't have the resources to really rebuild it. it but a lot of people complained that he was just covering up the old archaeological sites. But he didn't get far in rebuilding the city of Babylon. All right. So much for Babylon right now. Now, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar died within about, oh, 17 or so years after he died, a series of kings, none of whom were really great, ruled, and finally, King Cyrus of Persia conquered Babylon, and Babylon's hegemony came to an end. All right, um, this brings us up to the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, I hope I don't confuse you. The Medo-Persian Empire, at first it was the Medes, they were the powerful ones, it was called the Kingdom of Media, but then it changed its name to Persia, and the name Persia stuck until modern times when it's changed its name to Iran. Now here's how, well, in a minute I'll tell you the story of how it changed from being the Medes and Persians to the Persians and Medes. The uh, king, the line of kings of Media Persia were Medians until one day you had a king who only had a daughter and had no sons. This king, though, to keep the Persians happy, married off his daughter to a Persian man, and in those days he became what your father was. Well. As time went on and this old king got older and realized he probably wasn't going to have any sons, um, he became fearful that the next king after him would be a Persian king. He didn't want that. So when his daughter had a child by her Persian husband, the king put Cyrus in a boat and floated him down the river, not the Tigris Euphrates, one of the rivers there in Persia with intent that he die. Now, we've run into three persons who have had this issue. Moses, Cyrus, and Sargon of Agad, all three of them were floated down a river. This practice of getting rid of unwanted babies was very, very common in the ancient world. Cyrus was floated down a river where he was found by some uh, sh uh, shepherds, reared up. The shepherds began to realize that, hey, this boy, whoever he is, he must be royalty because he looked like a royal person. They eventually figured out that he was the child whom the king had put in a boat and floated down a river. Cyrus grew up and went back to his grandfather's palace and he must have had a lot of charisma because he was able to overthrow his grandfather. There are two accounts of what he did to his grandfather, both of them very benevolent. One was he told his grandfather, I know you're no longer a threat to me. You can roam around the palace at will do it where you want to and I'll give you a daily allowance. Another account was he made him governor of one of the distant provinces to get him out of his hair. But uh, unlike the other kings who would have killed that king they overthrew, Cyrus, it was said, did not. Cyrus then became the ruler. He was known as Cyrus the Great. Now, once in power, as is the case of a lot of men, in power, at home he was invicted. His wife urged him, hey, you've got to conquer. You must, you must conquer. You've got to go. It's your duty. It's your job. You must go conquering. Finally, Cyrus seated and began a program of conquest. And in his program of conquest, he was highly successful. He conquered several nations during his time. Now, first one I want to mention was Lydia. Lydia is the first country that we know of that coin, had coins, silver coins, gold coins, and even coins made of baser metals. I don't know which one, but I mean, we have coins made of nickel and coins made of copper and coins made of silver, but any more silver coins or sandwiched with copper in the middle and silver on each side. But anyway, Lydia was the first nation to use coins as money. 
<clears throat> Lydia got rich through trade, and one day Lydia, the king of Lydia, decided, hmm, do I want to go fight the against the Persian Empire or not? Lydia, the king of Lydia consulted an oracle, and this is the way oracles answer, folk. It will be sunny today unless it rains. Well, like a typical weatherman, there's a 30% chance of rain today. I mean, you know, it might, that means it might and it might not, and we, quite frankly, we don't know. I may have told you, but when I was a youngster, the weathermen could predict tomorrow's weather six times out of seven. Today we have computers galore, and we have satellites in orbit. We can see the whole world, and today's weathermen can predict tomorrow's weather right six times out of seven. All right, point I'm making is the, the, the oracle told the king of Lydia, if you go to war against the Persians, you will destroy a great empire. So the king of Lydia went to war against the Persians, he destroyed his own empire. Uh, these oracles could really pull a fast on me sometimes. We'll have more to say about that. Even though, now I will say, the oracles treated Alexander the Great really well. They deceived Philip of Macedon, his father, they treated Alexander quite well, but that's another issue. Uh, but anyway, um, Cyrus conquered Lydia. He uh, then went on to, um, well, to, to conquer, well, he, he didn't conquer Egypt. That was done by his son. But, He's remembered mostly not just for his conquests, and again, he consolidated the conquest of the Assyrian against the Assyrian Empire, kept it under control, conquered Lydia, went east, and conquered the lands to the east, got to the border of India. But he's remembered more for his kindness and benevolence. He allowed the Jews to return to their homeland. In fact, in the first year of his reign, He told the Jews.